Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to uh, give this presentation here. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. Uh, this is a beautiful venue uh, besides. So um, I thought a lot about what I would talk about in, in, in my presentation, and I decided that instead of giving you a list of publications and our own work and other people's work updating you on the microbiome field, what I thought I would do is give you more of a conceptual framework to think a little bit more about uh, microbiome research uh, in general. So you'll sort of get the idea as I go through, the, through my talk here. So since I'm the first one to, to talk about the microbiome, I have to show you this obligatory uh, first introductory slide. So the microbiome is very complex. It's not only bacteria, but there are viruses, archaea, and other life form, and microeukaryotes like fungi and yeast. Uh, and these interact in very complex ways, but for the purposes of my talk, I'm just going to focus primarily on bacteria. Now, the gut microbiota is particularly unique in terms of composition and microbial density. It's uh, one of the most, uh, one of the richest and, and I think one of the most densely populated microbial communities on Earth. And many of these organisms are difficult to culture, although I think microbiologists have gotten better over this over the years. So this is my 30,000-foot uh, view of how we interact with our gut microbiota. The microbiota lives topologically in the external environment of the world, meaning that's an lumen of the gut. The internal environment of the uh, of the of the of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the human uh, is uh, contains the mucosal immune system down in the bottom, and what separates us from the external world is remarkably only one cell layer thick, and that's the intestinal epithelium. Now, we produce substances like uh, mucin and antimicrobial peptides that help to shape the microbiota and, and play a role in its function, but in return, the microbiota does a lot of things, and I won't get into details here, but that help to regulate immune function. For the purpose of thinking about diet, um, there is a really important notion about how the microbiota and fiber, for example, interact uh, at the mucus barrier here, which is a very important uh, barrier function that I'll f uh, focus on a little bit later. But it's also important to recognize that what you eat in terms of uh, diet, antibiotics, and xenobiotics not only shape the composition of the microbiota, but diet in particular is a substrate for the microbes that actually produce a lot of metabolites that we normally cannot produce, that we end up absorbing, that circulate uh, throughout our bodies. And the notion is that together with the ability to produce these metabolites that we absorb, as well as the microbiota to shape mucosal immunity, it's somehow playing a role in the increasing incidence of many different types of diseases that we see associated with industrialization. So this is a, a conceptual overview of, of the way that I think about where we currently are in the microbiome space. Um, and uh, at the very top, we have animal model data, uh, which shows functionality uh, in terms of the microbiota and health and disease. And we have human association studies, things that are associated with the structure of the microbiota, particular health or disease state. Sadly, the only intervention that we have now deeply intervening on the microbiota is basically using stool transplants, fecal microbiota transplantation for a specific disease process, and this is clostridial difficile infection. But we do want to get down to the bottom here. We want to have new therapeutics and diagnostics. So that's the evolution of the field. We're up at the top here, and what we do is we want to get down to the bottom here. So how do we get along that axis? Well, um, we spun up a microbiome program across the entire campus of the University of Pennsylvania that I helped to co-direct called the Pen Shop Microbiome Program. And part of that program is focused on human intervention, actually doing human subject studies to prove cause and effect relationships in human biology, because we believe that the only way to get down this axis is actually to begin studying humans, to understand whether or not what we study in animal models is actually relevant to human disease, and I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So uh, these are the things I want to cover, uh, diet and the gut microbiome, uh, the difference between and the similarities between mice and men, dietary fiber, the gut microbiome intestinal mucosal barrier, and diet and microbiome and its metabolome and health and disease. So there are challenges to characterizing the effect of diet on human gut microbiome. Humans are uh, poorly adherent to standardized dietary regimens. Current tools to characterize dietary composition and intake are imperfect. There's a reciprocal nature of dietary composition 
to maintain isocaloric consumption, making it difficult sometimes to determine the factor responsible for an observed outcome. Diet uh, can have profound impacts on the host's biology independent of the gut microbiota. And both intensive controlled feeding experiments and large outpatient cohort studies are expensive and challenging to complete. So it's for that reason that myself and other people that study animal models has an, an, a significant level of, of utility when thinking about diet and the gut microbiome. You know, tight control of defined diets over a long period of time. Multiple biological replicates are feasible. Germ-free uh, animals can be used to examine the effect of diet independent of the gut microbiome. Uh, defined microbial consortia, complete human gut microbiota studies can be performed in notobiotic mice. And most importantly, uh, you can determine cause and effect relationships involving diet and the gut microbiome. But are mice like humans when we think about diet and the microbiota? So this is actually the first study we published uh, in the field of gastroenterology. Here we had two genotypes of mice. We had a, a wild-type mouse and, and a group of knockout mice. And it's not important what the gene actually was that we knocked out, but we actually treated them with two different diets, a normal diet and a high-fat diet. And we can see clearly on the high-fat diet over here that the colors in the histogram are massively different at a phylum level. And it's consistent regardless of whether or not you're a wild-type or a knockout mouse. So diet has a massive effect and a very consistent effect on a composition of the mouse microbiota. So what about humans? Well, we published this study a couple years ago where uh, this was a controlled feeding experiment. We had 10 healthy volunteers, and we randomized into a high-fat, low-fat diet. And this was a 10-day inpatient stay, uh, and we collected stool samples. And so the results are, are summarized in, that, in, in this, what we call a principal coordinate analysis. So each dot is the entire composition of microbiota that's basically simply a, one stool sample. And you can see that there are separate colors. So each color is a different individual. Each ball is a separate stool sample, separate day of the study. For each color ball, there's always one ball that's different from all the other balls that cluster together. That one ball that's different from all the other balls is day one of the study. So that means that within 24 hours, the human gut microbiota changes composition into another state. But the other important thing is that you can see how all the colors are different from each other. That's intersubject variability. So although highly statistically significant change occurs within 24 hours, that change is exceedingly modest compared to how different we are from each other. The other point is that the trajectory from day one to all the other days is seemingly different, seemingly stochastic uh, and unpredictable. And that's very different from what we saw in mice. In mice, it's very consistent. Uh, change and it's very large. In humans, it's inconsistent and very small. And I'll give you another example of this, vegans and omnivores. Vegans and omnivores have a very different diet, but the gut microbiota composition between a vegan and omnivore is very, very um, small. All right, so this, this is one of the challenges we face when we focus on mouse data and diet compared to humans. So dietary fiber, the gut microbiota intestinal uh, mucosal barrier, I'm going to talk a lot more about this concept, um, I think, later on this afternoon in the, in the fiber symposium, but let me just show you two or three slides about this. So we live in a mutualistic relationship with our gut microbiota. Uh, the intestinal mucus is a source of nutrition for the gut microbes, and then bacteria are very fermentative. They digest undigestible carbohydrates, and they produce short-chain fatty acids. So there's a biological reason why bacteria like fermentation. It's because they have a high level of representation for many enzyme classes called glycoside hydrolases, polysaccharide lyases, and carbohydrate esterases that are important in the digestion of glycans, the hydrolysis of many different glycoside moieties. And this is just one notion of what we call um, starch utilization um, um, mechanisms in a particular organism. And the, the nice thing about it is that there are genomic databases that can map to each one of these enzymatic functionalities. And if you know the genes, and you could look at the genome of an organism and array the different type of uh, genes that are responsible for the digestion of, uh, of uh, fermentable fiber. And these, these different types of enzyme capabilities are on our outer membrane of bacteria, on the cell membrane, and in between. The bottom line is we understand the, the deeply the biological mechanisms by which bacteria actually uh, uh, digest glycans. 
this actually has relevance because uh, remember mucus is a glycan substance in and of itself. So what happens is that if you eat a high fiber diet, bacteria tend to like the high fiber that you ingest in diet as a source of nutrition. So prefer preferentially digest that high fiber that you, uh, that you ingest. On the other hand, if you have a fiber free diet, the bacteria will turn their attention uh, uh, from a m metabolic standpoint to digesting your mucus. So without uh, fiber in the diet, you have a thinner mucus because it's being digested by the microbes and it predisposes to development of disease. In this particular work by Eric Martins, you are predisposed to develop infectious processes at the mucosal surface because your microbiota has digested your mucus. I'm going to talk a lot more about those mechanisms and the science behind it and potential implications uh, in my talk this afternoon. Um, I, I will tell you up front that uh, there's a very interesting immunologic input uh, into this and, and how uh, uh, fiber uh, actually helps to protect mucosal barrier function. So my last section is diet, gut microbiome, metabolome, and health and disease. So one of the studies that we published early on was association between many different types of micronutrients along the y-axis and bacterial taxa along the x-axis. This is a heat map. So things that are positively correlated are red, things that are negatively correlated are blue, and the intensity of the color indicates the strength of the correlation. I just point out to you two different bacterial genera, Bacteroides and Prevotella because if you look at these associations with diet, they're completely opposite with each other. When, when, it's, when it's blue and Prevotella, it's red and Bacteroides and vice versa. I'll come back to that in my next slide. So there are associations between diet in humans and the gut microbiome. So for example, there's a decrease in gut microbiome richness. That's a decrease in the numbers of various types of bacteria in their genes that's associated with both disease states and a consumption of a westernized diet. So what do I mean by that? Individuals with marked obesity, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, inflammatory phenotype have low bacterial richness. Consumption of an agrarian diet rich in fiber has an increase of bacterial richness. And energy-restricted diets increase bacterial drain richness. This is essentially what we see worldwide with individuals living, for example, in agrarian societies like Africa, having a richer microbiota and having a less uh, incidents or lower incidence of metabolic diseases than individuals living in industrialized nations. So back to the Bacteroides and Pravatella thing that I showed you on the previous slide. So the holy grail in the field was to try to classify people based on the structure of the microbiota and the European Metahead group uh, uh, had published a paper uh, where they claimed that individuals could be classified into one, uh, one of three enterotypes that were dominated by either Bacteroides, Prevotella, or Ruminococcus. And it turns out that if you have high Bacteroides, you have low Prevotella, and vice versa. Now, this is a little bit controversial in the field because it's not completely separate. It's probably more like a gradient. But this actually has biological relevance because it's been repetitively shown that individuals living in agrarian societies have high levels of Prevotella and very low levels of Bacteroides, versus people living in industrialized nations, they have high levels of Bacteroides and low levels of Prevotella. So this mimics what we actually see globally in various uh, uh, locations around the world. Um, so does that actually have relevance to human health and disease? Well, this is work by Frederick Backhead. So it's been known for a long time, and you probably know this better than, than, than I do, that a consumption of uh, uh, indigestible carbohydrates uh, improves postprandial glycemic response. The mechanisms are not clearly understood, uh, but what Frederick has shown is that individuals who have high levels of Prevotella are more likely to respond favorably to um, high consumption of complex uh, fiber substrates versus uh, individuals that have high levels of Bacteroides. That sort of makes sense because Prevotella is actually very rich in glycoside hydrolases, the types of enzymes required to digest uh, plant-based products. So the whole notion is that, well, maybe you could predict somebody's dietary response to a particular intervention based on a composition of the microbiota. Alternatively, maybe you might want to change somebody's composition of the microbiota to make them respond more favorably to a dietary intervention. Well, we're going to see more and more of this in the literature, and that is the use of complex 
data sets to predict outcomes and responses. This is work done by the Weizmann Institute where they did 24-hour uh, continuous blood glucose monitoring in a large uh, proportion of individuals and found these individuals had a high level of intersubject variability in their postprandial glycemic response. That's how high your blood glucose levels rise after you eat a meal. <clears throat> That postprandial glycemic response is a very strong indicator for diabetes and risk factor for coronary vascular disease, so it's a very important endpoint. What they discovered was that by, by combining microbiome sequencing information, some blood tests and anthropometric data, uh, that in fact they could come up with a calculator that could uh, calculate and determine what type of food you should eat to maximize improvement in postprandial glycemic response. And they actually showed this in a discovery cohort and a validation cohort. So this has actually gained a lot of attention in the field, that the microbiome has features that allow you to predict what you should actually eat. Now, I've heard them give this talk a couple of times, and I can tell you that the type of diets that this calculator comes up with um, is not intuitively obvious. It's not intuitively obvious that if you eat this type of food that on an individual basis this would improve your postprandial glycemic response. So it's a notion of using the gut microbiome features uh, through high dimensional computational biology uh, to come up with personalized diets. And people have begun to do this with uh, protein and amino acids. So the gut microbiome uh, not only shapes the composition of the microbiota, but as I mentioned, produces a lot of small molecules that after pers pass metabolism through the liver, circulate widely throughout the body, and that's our notion of how the microbiome could actually impact upon a lot of other organ systems. But we don't know the plasma tylites in humans that are influenced by the gut microbiome for, via diet. We know that in mice, uh, that there are hundreds of things in the plasma of, of, of uh, mice that are different in a germ-free mouse versus a colonized mouse, but we don't know what that is in a human. So why is this relevant? And I just show you this um, example here, that consumption of dietary fat delivers choline to the microbiota, and the microbiota converts it into a gas, trimethylamine, and that gas after oxidation by the liver turns into TMAO, which is a risk factor for coronary vascular disease in humans, and this is work by Stan Hayes, and he shows that that accelerates coronary vascular disease in mice. Okay, so it's a notion that what you eat could lead to a metabolite that plays a role in disease. So uh, when we think about the types of analytic tools that we use to study the microbiome, we have sequencing technologies, and largely what we do now is what we call shotgun metagenomic sequencing. We sequence all the DNA in a sample, and that tells us about the proportion of different types of microorganisms as well as their genes. But a different way of thinking about functionality is to look at metabolites that are produced by the microbiota, some of which are coming through diet. And we actually think that the intersection, trying to look at how different patterns of microbes are associated with various types of metabolites will tell us more about functionality. So in my last couple of slides, I want to tell you about the results, uh, some preliminary results of a study we call Food and Resulting Microbial Metabolites. The objective was to determine the relationship between dietary composition, gut microbiome composition, and metabolic products that are present in the gut lumen and the plasma of humans. This was a, a two-week intensive inpatient feeding study where we had vegans, omnivores, and omnivores randomized to consume exclusive enteronutrition diet. This is a liquid polymeric formulation diet called modulin that we use that's actually used to treat inflammatory bowel disease. So we looked at the impact of those diets on the composition of the microbiome, but then we performed an intervention uh, to determine its effect on the metabolome that I'll show you in the next couple of slides. It's important to recognize that the vegans were allowed to be outpatients because they're trustworthy in terms of their diet, so we didn't have to lock them up. But the omnivores we had to keep as an inpatient, um, but we actually saw that signal in our data analysis, and I'll explain to you what we actually saw. So this was the, the study, the design of the study. So the first five days of the study, comparing this point to this point here, is the impact of diet on the composition of the microbiome. 
Halfway through, we uh, basically reduce bacterial load with an ant antibiotics and a gut purge polyethylene glycol. And comparing this time point before the purge to after the purge, the difference is um, identifying microbial metabolites produced or consumed by microbes. And as the microbiota actually returns with reconstitution, uh, we can correlate increase or decrease of metabolites with recurrence of these microbes and diet to identify the key drivers. And what we did was shotgun metagenomic sequencing across the all the time points. We did deep uh, plasma and fecal metabolomics, and we actually, actually looked at the mucosal immune system. I don't have time to tell you a lot about the study, but let me just show you some initial results here. So because we did shotgun metagenomic sequencing, we can quantify at each day the proportion of reads of sequences that are either microbial, which are green, or human, which are blue. So at the beginning of the study, during the dietary phase, you can see all the reeds are green because they're all microbes. But when we cleaned out the gut, we, it, it all turns to blue because the only thing we can see are human reeds in the stool. And then the blue goes away and the green comes back as the microbiota reconstitutes itself. So we think it's very important not only to run a longitudinal study, but have a dynamic interaction that would allow us to map features between the metabolome and the microbiome. So this is looking at richness. This is the numbers of different types of organisms in the community. So you can see that on a Western diet, it's very rich, and you, we clean out the gut, a lot of the organisms go away, and then it returns. It turns out that a vegan's microbiota is more resilient to this type of stress because it doesn't drop down as far and it actually returns to a higher state. And uh, on uh, the, the enteronutrition diet, it drops, but it doesn't actually return. So what happens to the composition of the microbiome? Well, this is a principal coordinate analysis. Each dot is a different sample. Dots that are closer together are more similar to each other than dots uh, in terms of composition, and dot, dots that are further apart mean that the composition of the microbiome between these samples are diff more different from each other. So each study day is a different color. Each diet is a different symbol. Let me just point out a couple of points here. Pre-intervention, this is the effect of diet on the microbiota. Everybody's over here in this circle. Within five days, you shift from up here down here to a different state on the modulin diet. So that's a big change because remember, all the vegans and omnivores are clustered together on top here. So that modulin enteronutrition diet has a bigger effect on the composition of the microbiome than the difference between an omnivore and a vegan. When a microbiota actually returns, it comes back in a different state. Uh, where vegans and omnivores are clustered together and the modulin diet now has shifted the microbiota completely different configuration. That means that we are now able to um, reconfigure the composition of the human microbiome based on an intervention that involves diet. Uh, what about all the different types of metabolites? Uh, so we have hundreds and hundreds of metabolites, 70,000 spectral features. How do we actually look at this? Well, what I'm showing you here are all uh, the different days of the study, 0, 5, 9, 12, and 15, that map to each intervention. Our BOS statisticians came up with this algorithm. So looking at each interval, if the log ratio is positive, meaning that the metabolite is increasing, we code that as a 1. If it's not statistically different at, 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 at any, between any interval, then we code that as a two. And if the log ratio is less than zero, being negative, that means that the metabolite is moving down and we code that as a three. So at each interval, we can code this with a four-digit number. And so just to give an example, it just shows hydrocyanamate in modulant diet. It's stable on diet, that's a two. It decreases with the purge, it's three, and it doesn't recover, and it just stays stable, it's a two. So the code, is 2322. Two, two. So what we can do now is we can look at all the different types of metabolites and all the different patterns, and they're basically arrayed on this diagram here. And we're looking at the proportion of the different types of metabolites based on each different type of diet. And so what you can immediately see is that on a vegan diet, which is green, all the metabolites cluster together in the middle here. And so why would that be? Well, that's because, remember I said the vegans were outpatients. They didn't change their diet. So two, the code two means that diet didn't have an effect on these metabolites, which makes perfect sense because they didn't change their diet. So they're all in the middle here. So it's a great control for us. But then um, most of the metabolites didn't change. And I'm just looking at showing you the stool samples, not the plasma samples. Yet 
on, on a log ratio, you can see there are hundreds of metabolites that actually do change with different types of patterns. So now we're in a process of matching all those metabolite patterns with the bacterial taxa and their genes, and we're finding, I think, fundamentally important things in human biology. So I have uh, essentially two more slides here, and again, this is this thought process, the bidirectionality of gut microbiome uh, investigation. So we study animal model systems because they're well-defined environmental conditions, defined genetics, um, a monotonous diet. For that reason, there's a high signal-to-noise ratio, and we can develop proof-of-concept cause-and-effect relationships in a modest-sized cohort. By contrast, humans are, are free-living, highly variable, uh, and they have genetic diversity and variable diet. And because of that, there's a very low signal-to-noise ratio. But small effect sizes over large populations can be highly impactful. So clean water and vaccinations probably have saved more lives than anything else, but the effect size is relatively small. I would put healthy diet is one of those things that are probably the most impactful things that we can actually do. But the challenge is that the effect size is relatively small and is a low signal to noise ratio, and the biology is exceedingly complex. So my point is that it's important to embrace the complexity of human biology through the use of high-dimensional analytic technologies together with advanced computational biostatistical platforms to really understand the complexity of human biology. I'm going to show you one example of this. This is our omnivore vegan study. So here we're looking at the micronutrients that an omnivore versus vegan actually consumes, and they're all right down here at the bottom, classified in different categories. The, the the vegans are green and the omnivores are purple here. And again, this is a heat map. Things that are positively correlated are red, things that are negatively correlated are blue. And you can see that there's the, the color patterns are absolutely opposite from each other. So we knew that. Vegans and omnivores eat very different things. What about the plasma metabolome? So looking at 363 small molecules in the blood, you can see that, again, there's almost an opposite pattern between vegans and omnivores and the plasma metabolome. Uh, so these features are very, very strong. We can also see this in the urinary metabolome, where, again, vegans, which are green, completely separate from omnivores, which are purple, right? So now we can use um, analytic tools, and I'm going to show you this result here. This is what we call a random forest analysis. This is a machine learning algorithm that picks out features and stratifies them by their ability to predict a dichotomous outcome. Either you're vegan or you're an omnivore. And what we can show is by looking at simply 30 different features here, we can predict with 94% accuracy if you're vegan or an omnivore, okay? So very, very strong features. And in fact, a lot of these metabolites here that show in green are actually from the microbiota. So if you're vegan, more of your plasma metabolites are from the gut microbiota than if you're an omnivore. And so using these mathematical tools, it's, we think that you can really understand the complex nature of biology in humans. So, um, you know, I'm not going to get to this because I'm running over time. This is a wonderful paper. You should take a look at it from Johan Aurex. It's, uh, it's a review on the convergence of systems biology versus reductionist approach to understand complex biology. In this particular article, he's focusing on genomics, but the, you, could, you could extend this to proteomics, metabolomics, a lot of other types of platforms. I'll be talking about that this afternoon. But the whole idea is that human biology is exceedingly complex, and you should embrace that, that complexity by using our highest throughput analytic platforms as well as uh, computational and biostatistical um, uh, ways of analyzing the results. So with that, let me just acknowledge a lot of people that were involved in this. This is just another demonstration that this takes a lot of team effort and team research. Nobody as a single individual would be able to do this alone. So with that, thank you very much.